you will be hearing a lot of marketing talks. This isn't a marketing talk. I'm not in marketing. I don't do marketing. Uh, this is nothing to do with marketing. Advertising isn't marketing. Marketing is marketing. Advertising is the voice of marketing. It's not a subset of marketing. Marketing people can do all the thinking they want, but without advertising to get it heard, it stays invisible. If you like, marketing is all the generals sitting back at headquarters, looking on maps, seeing what they want to happen. Advertising is the sergeants who have to actually go out and make it happen. There are, just so you know, in the UK, 18.3 billion pounds is spent every year on all five forms of advertising and marketing. Of that, 4% is remembered negatively, sorry, 4% is remembered positively, 7% is remembered negatively, 89% isn't noticed or remembered. So that's roughly 90% of advertising isn't noticed or remembered. It's ignored. Probably all got brilliant marketing thinking behind it. But because it isn't noticed or remembered, it's a waste of money. The, um, if you look at it, if you live in a major conurbation, big city, you're exposed to roughly 2,000 advertising messages a day. Between pop-ups on your laptops, pre-rolls, uh, press ads in the free sheets, uh, posters on the cross tracks or on the um, freeway as you drive in, uh, TV, radio, all the different mediums there are. Roughly 2,000 go by you, and they're pretty much just pollution that you ignore. To give you an example, uh, not being advertising, but just as a consumer, just as a consumer now, hold your hand up if you remember an advert from yesterday, that you saw yesterday, as a consumer. Nobody? Nobody remembers a single advert from yesterday that they saw as a consumer. Okay, and what we got here about three or four hundred people? You were each exposed to 2,000 ads, that's 800,000 ads, and you can't remember one. Probably each of those ads had brilliant marketing thinking behind them. Genius university graduates behind them working out all kinds of complicated strategies and you can't remember one and there's 800,000 exposures just in this room. So, why is that? It's because stupid people think complicated is clever and smart people know simple is what works. But stupid people can't bring themselves to, to be simple because they like to feel clever. And they feel clever by making it complicated. So, I'll give you an example of what I mean. I'm going to show you an old Hollywood <coughs> film with Bob Hope in. It's a, just an illustration, an analogy of, um, imagine Bob Hope is a creative person being briefed. He's on his way to a gunfight in this film, but imagine he's being briefed by the client, the strategy guys, the planners, and just see how they brief him. Can you play the first video, please? Just 
killed my brother. Here's a tip. He draws from the left, so lean to the right. Draws the left, so lean to the right. Son, well, let's in on something. Fold towards sunset, there's a wind from the east. So you better aim to the west. Cross the left, so lean to the right, there's a wind from the east, so better aim to the west. I know this Joe like a book. He crouches when he shoots. So stand on your toes. He draws the left, so lean to the right, there's a wind from the east, better aim to the west. He crouches when he shoots, so stand on your toes. Thanks. So the issue is getting the problem right, and the issue is simplifying the problem down to what's usable. Not making it as complicated as possible, but simplifying it down to what's usable. We concentrate on the unimportant parts because we think it's all complicated, so it must make us look intelligent, and we're more interested in making ourselves look intelligent than in getting the right solution. David Ogilvy said, strategy is sacrifice. And it's very hard for us to sacrifice things. And we don't want to decide which is more important. So we throw everything into the mix. So, and consequently, because we're all now seduced by technology and new thinking and jargon, we throw as much of that as we possibly can. So we look as intelligent as we possibly can in the meetings. So if you ask any creative in an ad agency nowadays what their job is, they might tell you that it's content curation, or it's heuristics, or it's algorithms, or it's big data, or it's native advertising, or it's storytelling, or it's mobile optimized, or wearable tech, or cross-platform, or rich media solutions, or memes, or tropes. Or they might tell you it's SEO, CRM, CSR, CTR, CMS, UGC, KPI, or ROI. Now, for my money, the only three letters missing is WTF. <laughs> That's not our job. That's just a load of technical people swapping a load of technical stuff with each other. That's nothing to do with talking to bus drivers, cab drivers, shop assistants, and housewives. The people that actually buy the stuff which is that talking to a very little margin of people that like to impress each other with long words. <coughs> we don't understand the media. We don't understand what we're doing. We've lost the thread of getting back to basics. We're so thrilled, so desperate. FOMO, fear of missing out on the latest thing, whatever, it, whatever the latest thing is. We're so scared of missing it that we no longer look at what the purpose of what we're doing is. So let's go back, let's keep it simple. And let's go back and look at what the purpose of what we're doing is. Let's start and look at what the purpose of media is. A 
That's the punter, the consumer. We started trying to reach the consumer with cave paintings on the walls of Lascaux 60,000 years ago. Then things changed and we had oil paintings, frescoes in the Renaissance. Then things changed and we had photography. Then it changed again and we had film. Changed again, we had TV. Changed again, and we had digital. Pretty soon it's going to change again to whatever the next thing is that's new and it will kill everything else and what, life will never be the same and we'll all be getting FOMO again. So it's always changing. Do you notice one thing that isn't always changing? One thing on there that's never changed, one thing on there that never will change. The bloke in the middle. Or the girl, the woman, the person in the middle. The punter, the consumer. That's never changed and that never will change. That's the actual media. These are just technical different ways of getting to the media. This is where the technicians live. This is the actual media we're after, the mind. If you know anything about behavioural economics, you know it's described as human understanding for business advantage. So you aren't going to get any business advantage unless you have human understanding. Bill Birnbach said our proper area of study is simple, timeless human truths. Simple, timeless human truths that apply to all races, all ages, all sexes, all religions, all everybody, everywhere. That's our proper area of study. That's the media. And we might use digital to get there. We might use photos to get there. We might use TV. We might use press. We might use anything to get there. We'll decide that when we decide how we want to occupy that ground. But that's our media, the human mind. Good ideas live there and they go viral there. How we buy space in that is with good ideas, not with technology. This is just a delivery system. We all know the numbers. Every hour, 23 hours are downloaded onto YouTube and 22 hours, 59 minutes is never seen again. So most of what's on YouTube is complete rubbish, never seen again. The good ideas are what gets taken off and goes viral. Because the good ideas, he passes it on to her, who passes it on to her, who passes it on to him, who passes it on to him, and that's how it goes viral. It goes viral mind to mind to mind to mind. And whatever device is available for passing it on, that's what they'll use. When a client says to me, I want some viral media, you have to tell them there's no such thing. There's viral ideas, but there's no such thing as viral media. David Abbott said, shit that arrives at the speed of light is still shit when it gets there. Doesn't matter what technology it gets by, if it's rubbish, it dies. What you want is something... Why we want things to go viral is it's free media. If I can, if I can create people talking about it, I've turned a £5 million account into a £25 million account. I've bought £20 million worth of free media just by going viral. But that's where it goes viral. Not here. This is just technology. I'll give you an example of um, what I mean. This is uh, a song that plays on ice cream trucks all over the UK. See if you recognise it. Can you play the second video, please? Never mind the pictures, just the music. Okie doke. Um, anybody know the name of that tune? Green Sleeves, yeah? I promise you everyone in the UK knows that tune. You've known it since you were little kids. Green Sleeves. Does anybody know who wrote it? 
No, you, you probably won't. Uh, it was Henry VIII who wrote it. King Henry VIII in 1530. He wrote it because he was trying to pull Anne Boleyn at the time. And um, he was married to, I don't know, Catherine of Aragon, somebody like that. He was married to someone else and he was trying to pull Anne Boleyn. And she used to turn up in court wearing a dress with green sleeves. So he wrote this song, Alas, my love, you do me wrong to cast me off discourteously, for I have loved you so long, delighting in your company. Green sleeves was all my joy, green sleeves was my delight, green sleeves is my heart of gold, and who but my lady, green sleeves. That's the tune, we all learn it as little kids. It's on every ice cream truck in the, com in the country. And it was written 500 years ago. And yet, it's still viral now. 1530 it was written, where the fuck was YouTube? Where the fuck was uh, Google? They're, 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 if you have to depend on this stuff to go viral, why would we know anything that happened before 1990? Good stuff goes viral because the brain uses what's ever around to make it go viral. And if we want viral, and if you're any good at all, of course you want viral, you go viral with an idea, not with a technique. This is just a delivery system. So, this is where we want it to go viral in the human mind. We need to know how that works, how that's going to work for us. And we need to keep it simple because I'm in the creative department, not in the complicated department. So I'm blue collar, and the creative department is blue collar, and the people we talk to are blue collar. The white collar department is over there, and they like it complicated. In the blue collar department, we like it simple. And here's how it, here's how it works in the simple department. Here's how the mind works when we're talking to ordinary human beings. You know this. This is nothing you didn't know. It's just put down so it's easy to talk about. This is a conversation, every conversation from the time you're born till the time you die. Got to have three elements, and it's got to work this way around. And the three elements have got to be impact, communication, persuasion. Now, it's got to work that way around because without impact, there can't be any communication or persuasion. You've got to have impact just to get anybody to know you're there. So once you've got some impact and people know you're there, you've got to say something to let them know what you want. You've got to communicate, which most advertising, as we know, doesn't. You've got to let them know what you want. Now, when they know you're there and they know what you want, but they don't know why they should do it, what's in it for them? So you need a third thing. This isn't rocket science. You know this in your life. You'll do this 20 times a day in your life, every day. If I'm at home, it's midweek now, say it's Wednesday, Wednesday night, and I'm at home, and there's a football game on the telly, and I'm watching the football on the telly, and I want a cup of tea. But I don't want to get up and make it, because I might miss a goal. But the wife's sitting there, she's not watching football. She could make it, but she doesn't know I want a cup of tea. And it's no good me sitting there trying to send thought waves to her. I've got to get on her radar. I've got to get her to understand that I want something, otherwise she'll just carry on sitting there, not watching the telly while I'm watching. So I've got to get on her radar. So I've got to say, Kath, Kath, Kath. And in the end she says, what? I'm on the radar. I've got impact. Now, I've got to say, in a la I've got to let her know what I want in a language she'll understand. Now, if I was to behave like most modern advertising, I'd say, smooth, warm, Refreshing. Family values. 
nice feelings. And hope she got it. And maybe I'd win a Cairns Award for it. She wouldn't know what I was talking about. But because we're not at Cairns, and we're not in the white collar department, we're in the real world, I say to her, make us a cup of tea. But she doesn't know why she should do it. She said, make it yourself. So I've got to think, well, hang on, what's in this for her? So I think, well, Wednesday night, the garbage men come round on Thursday morning. That means we've got to put the garbage out tonight. I know she doesn't like doing that. So I say to her, uh, OK, if you make us a cup of tea now, when this game's over, I'll go and put the garbage out. Now, if she thinks that's a good deal, I've got a sale. Impact, communication, persuasion. Everything in your life works that way. If I'm trying to sell a car, if I'm trying to get the kids to go to bed, whatever I'm trying to do, that's any conversation in your life. Can you think of any reason you wouldn't want your advertising to work like that? Why you would, want, why you would say, well, I want impact, but I don't want communication or persuasion. I want people to notice my ads, but I don't want them to know what, what they've got to do, and I don't want them to see a reason they should do it. Is that likely? I don't think so. But that's too, that's too simple for the geniuses we have in most agencies. So, you won't see that. You won't see that on an advertising brief. Impact, the, uh, the most important sentence on a brief is never written on a brief. I've never seen it on a brief. All the years I've been in it, and nobody I know has ever seen it on a brief. What's the most important sentence on a brief that's never written on a brief? People must notice this advertising. Never written on a brief. Take them for granted. Take them, we're doing an ad, so of course everybody will notice it. Well, is that true? Just take an ordinary night's TV viewing. I, I don't know the numbers, but uh, assuming there's 10 commercials in a break, and assuming there's four breaks an hour, that's 40, and assuming the average person watches four hours a night. What's that, 160? Well, round it up, call it 100. Say there's 100 commercials on a night they'll watch. That gives me 1% share of voice. I've got a one, if I just rely on that kind of thinking, forget about impact, we'll just do this. I've got a one out of 100 chance that you'll notice. That's marketing. This is advertising. This is marketing, but this is advertising. And you need to know this because if it's going wrong, you need to know who to fire. If people are noticing our ads, but they're not selling anything, I fire that. I fire the marketing department. If they're not noticing our advertising, I fire the creative department. You might also want to look at this as part of your um, hierarchy of comms how you put your media together. This is broadcast media, so this will be TV, posters, old-fashioned broadcast media. This will be more online, where you've got time to talk to people, or however you want to do it. <coughs> but as Birnbach said, <coughs> principles endure, formulas don't. This isn't a formula, but if, if you take this as principles, that's what we're going to do, then you'll have all different techniques of making that happen. If, if, that's your, how you put, if that's how you set your department up, if that's how you, it's like a football team. Forwards, midfield, defence, however you set, want to set it up. If, if they're scoring a lot of goals against us, I fire the goalie. If the goalie's not letting in any goals, but we're not scoring, I fire the strikers. You just need to know, where's, you need to identify where's your weakness, what are we supposed to do, clear... If that's our job, we've defined what we're supposed to do and where's the weakness. And if, if, if we've decided that's our spread of communications, our hierarchy of comms, where's our weakness in that? You can get into this as in-depth as you want, but if you keep it simple to start with, you'll know what you're analysing. If you start off with it complicated, you won't. If you... Um, The thing I learned from economics was uh, diminishing marginal returns. In all circumstances, it works like that. Uh, 
This is, uh, hmm, I think that's effort and that's return, or that's effort, no, that's effort, and that's return. Everything works on a parabolic curve. So if you put uh, this part of the process, you're putting in that much effort for that much return. That's a good deal. This part of the process, you're putting in that much effort for that much return. You're putting in two or three times the effort for a quarter of the return. You just want to make sure you're working in this part of the process, not in this part of the process. And this is where impact is, in this part of the process. You can get all your thinking right on persuasion and marketing, but that's up here. That doesn't work if this doesn't work. Now, so how does that work? Given the impact, is the most crucial part because we know from the numbers, four percent is remembered positively, seven percent is remembered negatively, eighty-nine percent isn't noticed or remembered. Yeah, eighty-nine percent fails here. Creative departments failing here. It's not even getting down to here. 89% in the UK, that's 17 billion quid, failing there. So, if impact is what's wrong, how's that work? Okay. First thing we need to do is look at impact. So, I'll give you... Um, This is impact as the punters understand it first, and then I'll give you the, uh, the reason why. Is this coming up on the screen or not? Yeah? Good. Imagine this is a commercial break. We'll keep it really crude. That's the first, well, is it? That's the first commercial. Second commercial. Third commercial. Fourth commercial. Fifth commercial. Sixth commercial. Seventh commercial. Now the break's over, we carry on watching the programme and we go to bed, next, more, next day we get up and we go to the supermarket. Which one of those commercials is more likely to have survived the erosion process? It's not, it's not hard work, is it? Any bus driver, any cab driver, any housewife, any shop assistant could tell you that. So, where we should be, if here's our commercial break, The commercial, the conversation in the average creative department will be, which commercial should we, what, what should we be doing? Should we be doing this commercial, which Ridley Scott shot? Or should we be doing this commercial, which won at Cannes last year? Or should we be doing this commercial, which was shot by a hot new Swedish director? Or should we be doing this commercial, which has got an interesting new technique they found on YouTube? Or should we be doing this commercial, which Campaign wrote a nice review of? Or should we be copying this commercial? You notice the one commercial they're not talking about. No commercial, nobody's talking about. Nobody will be talking about this because it's different. And nobody wants to be different. Everybody's scared stiff of being different. There's a big risk in being different. Steve Jobs said, why would you want to join a Navy when you could be a pirate? This is the Navy, and this is the pirate. There's no agreement for being the pirate. Nobody will like the pirate. Everybody sneers at the pirate. But you know what? The pirate works. Why does that work? It's the software your mind works on. It's called Gestalt. If you understand the human mind, and remember, business, uh, 
human understanding for business advantage, behavior economics, if you understand the human mind, the software it's programmed on is gestalt. Zeros and ones, binary, it works on binary, just like a computer. So it works really fast. If you've got, if you've got any children, it, the mind groups everything really fast. Nowadays, it's, it's happened so fast you don't even notice it. But if you've got any children, when they're born, they're in a state that Freud calls id, ID. And what that means is they're not even aware that they, all they are is awareness. Everything is everything. Gradually, if you've got any children, you watch them. They put everything in their mouth. Their fingers, their toes, their cot, their toys, their blanket, they bite everything. Gradually, their mind programs itself that if it hurts, it's me. If it doesn't hurt, it's not me. They program themselves into the state of ego, meaning I am, separate to the world. They program themselves to learn that there's a them that's separate to everything else. So I can move this, but I can't move that. Yeah? But it's binary. And that's how the world works. That's how our minds work. Really, really fast. Binary. Up, down, in, out, left, right, hot, cold, black, white. Really, really fast. So fast we don't even notice it. Like a computer, binary is always the fastest way to go. Now, what use is that to us? We group things. If I do that, how many digits did I hold up? Ten. How did you do that? You didn't have time to go one, two, three, four, five, six. What you did is two hands, five, five on each, two fives is ten. Your mind groups things really fast. If What use is that to us? Here's the human mind. And there's 19 commercials in it. Two, six, eight, ten... Nineteen commercials, yeah. If I have one more, making it twenty, what share of your mind have I got? One out of twenty is a percentage. Must be five percent, right? But knowing what we now know about gestalt, if I have one more, and it's like that, what share of your mind have you got? Have I got? Well, we know from what we saw before, that what your mind does is group things. So it groups everything that's like this and everything that's not like that. So now what share of your mind have I got? It's not hard work. Just by being... Re what, what that is, is repositioning everyone else. We reposition the competition. Well, you can't position yourself... You, you can call it positioning yourself, but you haven't positioned yourself unless you've repositioned the competition. The, how we reposition the competition in the real world is we change the question. If we change the question, we own the context, and the context is all important. If we're going to be that, we can't be that by being another one of those. We can't just carry on pretending we're that and calling us, which is what most advertising does. They write on their website that we believe in creativity and then they see a whole load of ads that are exactly the same crap as everybody else. You call yourself that, but you actually are that. You say you're a pirate, but you're actually in the Navy. You're frightened to be a pirate. If you really want to do this, and that takes a lot of guts, you have to... To own, the, to own the context, you have to own the question. Change the question. I'll give you, for instance, uh, any Americans in the room? Okay, okay you can't answer this. You, you know the answer. Okay. Let me ask you, clients, if you really want to reposition, go back and look through, well, tomorrow, I've got to talk tomorrow, and we'll talk about how you do that, uh, uh, and the people who've done that bravely people like Apple, when you really reposition the competition, Apple or Nike, you do something really brave to reposition the competition, not just pretending a little clever line. 
Don't any other advertising people will understand. If you really reposition the competition, then you do what Barack Obama did. And incidentally, what, what Donald Trump did. If you really reposition the competition, if you're really brave enough to do it. Uh, so the other thing I'll tell you, last thing I'll tell you about going viral, is, um, and remember, this isn't for marketing people, this is for creatives. I know marketing people will say this is all wrong. Viral works this way around. You got, I, I, I was, um, if this is opinion formers, and this is opinion followers, I was talking to a client. I was talking to a client and um, direct line in England, and I was looking up how much money they spend. Now, a fair amount of money is five or ten million. Getting on a, he a lot of money is twenty million. Direct line spent eighty-three million. They've got ten percent of the financial market, which itself is ten percent of the overall advertising market. So eighty-three million is a lot of money. Now, direct line, if they want, they, can, they don't have to do any good advertising. They've got so much money, they can do any old crap and it will work. That's what it does. You just bash someone over the head with it forever and it will work. But, but there's only one person that's got 83 million quid. What about all the others that have only got 20 million quid? How are they going to do it? How are they going to get their 20 million to work like 80 million? They've got to go viral. And where you go viral is you get opinion formers to talk to opinion followers. Now, opinion formers, if you ever go into a pub, you'll see uh, <coughs> usually one guy will be leading, there'll be a group of five blokes, and one guy will be doing most of the talking. He'll be talking about what he saw on Discovery last night, uh, this thing he read about German tanks, uh, Manchester United... Uh, what their new formation's going to be. Whatever the new thing he's learned, he's looking for new stuff all the time to lead the conversation. And the other guys are all happy to chip in, but they don't want to actually be the leader. He's the leader. He's the funniest. He's an opinion former. You look at women in Starbucks, they see a table full of women, there'll be one woman doing most of the talking, and the other women are happy to listen and chip in when they want. They're happy to let her do most of the talking. But she'll be the opinion former. If you actually haven't got the money the opinion leader has got, you want to isolate the opinion formers with your advertising so they can influence for each of them will influence four or five opinion followers. Now, the opinion formers aren't influenced by loads and loads of the same old stuff. The opinion formers will need something new, something unusual to talk about. So when you're doing that brave advertising, it works to go viral with opinion formers. If you've got 83 million quid, you don't need to bother with good advertising. You can do any old crap and spend the daylights out of it, and it will work. Bash everybody over the head, and it will work, just because you've got a load of money. But if you haven't got a load of money, and you don't want to waste all your money you have got, and that's what I get on best with clients who are in trouble. And they can't do what they like. They've got to do what they need to do to survive. So then we do, we do this kind of work. They might not be comfortable with it, but it works. And because it creates a lot of word of mouth. What we used to call word of mouth, what they now call viral, going viral. Which is you get, for every pound you spend, you can create five pound of talk. So you're creating a lot of free media. You only do that by reducing it down to a simple thought that will own the break, a simple daring thought, not by tons and tons and tons of complicated jargon. <clears throat> the value in learning this is all of this stuff. Rory uh, always had a line that I love. He said, creative people have a fear of the obvious, but they must sell their work to people who have a love of the obvious. Clients love the obvious because they see all the other clients are doing it and they don't see why they should do any different. Creative people, you naturally know you do something different because that's why you're creative. 
but you never bother explaining it to a client. Now, if you take all this that we've just done here and use it to explain to a client why, he'll, instead of wasting his money, he'll actually get value for money, you can actually use this to sell good stuff to your clients because this is then a sound business decision instead of just a, hey, let's do something weird and wacky because I'm creative. This is sound, logical, common sense. And a good, in my experience, entrepreneurs, I get on much better with chief executives than I do with junior marketing people because junior marketing people just want to use the latest jargon where chief execs want a very fast conversation. How much is this going to cost me? Why will it work? And we can have a conversation like that. They're entrepreneurs. This is a sort of log simple logic entrepreneurs like. So uh, my time's up.